next song will be number 214. We have this hope, number 214. singing. All right, did we get some oxygen in our brain? <laughs> some? That's good. We're going to turn our attention to early childhood now, and um, Look at some brain development and God's schedule for spiritual strength. Now, as I begin, uh, some of you may be saying, well, you know, this is a little past the stage that I'm at with my children, but trust me as we go through it, I even find children themselves love to hear this content because it just really unpacks an element of true education that we don't often explore. And uh, I, I also have found that even for many older adults, they're like, oh, and it kind of brings a light bulb on for why maybe they've experienced some things in life as it goes back to the education they experienced as a child. So anyway, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. <clears throat> Father in heaven, oh, thank you for all the blessings we've had thus far today. Lord, again, we invite your presence to be with us. We know that we need you. Help us to feel our need of you even more. And Lord, as we study this precious counsel you've given us, please speak to us, Lord, and please speak through me. Send us your Holy Spirit. May the words I share be from you and not my own. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We have a statement in Christian Education, page 8, that has often been uh, neglected or forgotten, and I'd like to bring it to our attention again and study it out in depth and look at the reasons for it. We're told that parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or 10 years of age. 
As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them God's great book of nature. Interesting. So here we have described a program for childhood until which age? Eight to ten. Okay. And it's telling us, first of all, who the teachers should be. Who's that? The parents. And uh, what should be the textbook? Nature. Does this sound like conventional curriculum in kindergarten today? (laughs) No, far from it. The only schoolroom for children until eight or ten years of age should be in the open air amid the opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery and their most familiar textbook, The Treasures of Nature. Interesting. Again, a far cry from kindergarten in the world today. And it's telling us that until age eight or ten, the parents should be the teachers, the textbook should be nature, and the schoolroom should be the open air. Now, we've tended to look at this, those of us who are familiar with it, and it has been very common in our church to say, well, that counsel was given because the benches were uncomfortable and the school was poorly ventilated and we have better schools now, so it doesn't apply today. Have you heard this argument before? Does God's counsel have an expiration date? (laughs) So this must apply today, even though maybe the schoolroom is a little better lit and we have better benches or whatever, but what's the principle here? Let's analyze this and let's look at the science behind it. And for those of you who were taking notes this morning, going through our list of 10 tactics that were damaging good thinking abilities, I left off number 10, so now you can fill in your notes. Uh, I've called it early formal academics. And I wanna be clear, we're not talking about learning. Children are born ready to learn, right? And God created them to learn. God created us to learn from all ages. But we're talking about the formal academic environment. That could be in the school, but it can also be in the home. And I want to specifically apply this within the home because I realize most of us here are following the home education uh, uh, plan. (laughs) Thank you. And uh, so I, I want us to realize that this is not just talking about the school, it's talking about what the children should study also. And so I want to talk about that. Now, if we look in the conventional education programs of the world, it's really interesting a lot of the changes that have occurred. They did a study comparing uh, kindergarten classrooms in 1998 with kindergarten classrooms in 2010, 12 years. They wanted to see what changed in 12 years. In 1998, 48% of kindergarten teachers considered reading fluently too much to expect of a kindergartner. Who would agree? (laughs) Certainly, that that would be too much to expect. Well, 12 years later, only 10% felt that way. Again, don't get stuck on the numbers. What we're just saying, though, is look at the shift in the expectations. In 1998, 29% of kindergarten teachers said that children should learn to read in kindergarten. 10 years, 12 years later, now it was 78% said, yeah, that's the right age to, to, for children to learn to read. In 98, there were around half of kindergartners in full-day programs. 12 years later, 81% in full-day programs. Time for art and music has dwindled with, uh, in the 2010 statistics, 90% of kindergartners were being taught to read, 97% composing and writing complete sentences, and 99% learning capitalization and punctuation. Kindergarten. (laughs) For some of you of maybe the older generation, you're going, whoa, that doesn't sound like the kindergarten that I was exposed to. And certainly that would be true. Uh, A lot has changed, and that's really my point here. What used to be a very hands-on play-based environment has shifted to a very academic focus. School districts today report a more structured academic or kindergarten program that centers on specific academic objectives and emulates what was once a grade one focus. Kindergarten has, let me move through, we can't cover everything here, an increasing societal focus on academic readiness has led to a focus on structured activities that are designed to promote academic results as early as preschool with a corresponding decrease in playful learning. 30% of U.S. kindergarten children no longer have recess. This isn't university, (laughs) this is kindergarten. No time for recess. Five and six-year-olds are being asked to, do, to sit doing math, reading, and writing for hours at a time, sometimes with no recess or a very short one. Some teachers have dispensed with snacks during half-day kindergarten because there just isn't any time. Many kindergartners take home homework every day. See the changes that have occurred. 
Teacher-led instruction in kindergartens has almost entirely replaced the active play-based experiential learning that we know children need from decades of research in cognitive and developmental psychology and neuroscience. Again, I'm just illustrating the changes that have occurred in what our expectations are for early childhood education. And many administrators and parents and teachers are thrilled with these new developments. But the majority of the body of scientific research is actually saying, wait a minute, put the brakes on here because children are not ready for this. And that's what I really want to look at here. They tell us, yeah, okay, the children might be learning, for some, learning some things in this environment, but what cost are we paying? What are the negative consequences of putting children through this environment? It's actually hindering proper brain development. In fact, there is no research evidence, contrary to what you'll hear online or on the news or wherever, there is no research evidence to support claims that earlier is better. By contrast, a considerable body of evidence clearly indicates the crucial importance of play, and we know from Spirit of Prophecy that should also include useful work in young children's development, the value of an extended period of playful learning before the start of formal schooling, and the damaging consequences of starting the formal learning of literacy and numeracy too young. What's too young? The weight of evidence suggests from the science that prior to the age eight or 10. Would that happen to coincide with the spirit of prophecy? <laughs> Let's look at some of this science. We're gonna look at some of the damages of what we're calling early formal academics. Again, I wanna clarify, this can be in the school, sending the child off to school, you'll see the greatest damage, but this could also be in the home as we're pressuring in the academics too young. Let's see how the brain develops a little bit. Anyone know what this is? A neuron, all right, the synapse is the connection between the neurons. This is a neuron we're seeing a representation of. It is more commonly known as a brain cell. Now, there are various processes of brain development. One of the major processes is something called myelination. Myelin is an electrically insulating compound that coats the axon of the neuron, and it speeds the information transfer but it speeds the information transfer to the point that it becomes usable. So previous to myelination, the neurons are very, they're so slow the brain doesn't really use them. <laughs> so really a major process of what we call development is myelination. When we see that little baby and he's learning to walk, learning to talk, and we see this process of development that's so exciting, a lot of what's going on inside is the neurons are myelinating. It speeds that information transfer. As is explained in this article, myelination of appropriate brain regions coincides or goes along with the development of specific cognitive functions, such as reading, development of vocabulary, and proficiency in executive decision making. So as a child learns these abilities, that's because the brain is developing and myelinating and enabling these abilities to, uh, to occur. So trying to force information over unmyelinated neurons is only going to cause damage. Now this process occurs in stages and on a pretty set schedule. Uh, let's look at some of this schedule. From conception to around 15 months, we have very basic brain development. From 15 months to around four and a half years, that is a primary developmental stage for the limbic system and the relationship areas of the brain. And I wanna pause there and just mention uh, the limbic system has a lot to do with the emotional development and of course those relationship areas. This is why it is so important that the little one, the babies, are with their mothers as much as absolutely possible. Um, that's when they're developing their emotional security and their understanding of relationship. Then at around four and a half to around seven years, we have the gestalt areas of the brain um, myelinating, or as Dr. Hannaford says, elaborating. And I should clarify that boys have a slower growth period during this stage than the girls. I did not say boys were slow. <laughs> I simply said they develop differently. And uh, there's about a two year difference there. So while we can say four and a half to seven years for the girls, it would be about up to around nine years for the boys. And then at around seven years in girls, at around seven or nine years in boys, we see the left hemisphere beginning a major surge in development. That continues for many years. And around eight years, we see the frontal lobe elaboration. Now, I just want to focus on these three areas, gestalt areas, logic areas, and the frontal lobe. Now, let's look at some functions of these parts of the brain. Left hemisphere deals with things like detail, parts and processes of language, 
linear patterns, logic, critical thinking, numbers, reasoning skills, while the right hemisphere deals with things like images, rhythm, emotion, intuition, imagination, creativity, feeling, faith, belief, and large motor control. Now, comparing these two areas of the brain, which hemisphere do you think would be very important for academic learning? The left, absolutely. Do you use the right? Sure, <laughs> you're gonna use the right, but you really need that left. The detail, the linear patterns, logic, numbers, reasoning, all those things, very essential for academic learning as we know it. Now I mentioned left hemisphere, right hemisphere, how about the primary motor cortex within the frontal lobe? That helps with fine motor development, very important for handwriting skills. Inner speech, uh, which is important for reading. Fine motor eye teaming and foveal focus, those are eye functions important for reading. Okay, now that we understand the importance of the left hemisphere for academic learning, as well as the primary motor cortex, part of the frontal lobe. Let's go back to our schedule development and see, okay, the left hemisphere is necessary for academic learning. What age does it begin development? Around seven in girls, around nine in boys. But what's a typical school starting age? Five, yeah, it depends. Five or six, if you're fortunate. <laughs> Most children are being put in a preschool environment that is academic focused even earlier than that. But even if it were six or seven, you're really before those areas of the brain have had a major surge in development. So what happens? Now, I do wanna just clarify here as I've been presenting on this for some time, I've found some people um, misunderstand a little bit. This is not purely anatomical. Um, it refers more to the functions of the different areas. This is why we usually use the words gestalt areas and logic areas, because it is not strictly the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, all right? The, the brain is very interconnected. In fact, there are parts of the right hemisphere that develop after parts of the left hemisphere and, and vice versa. So what is the correct uh, way to state this is that the areas of the brain responsible for many academic types of learning are not developed until around eight years of age and even 10 years in boys. Okay, that's physical brain development. That's how God designed it. So can we accelerate learning somehow? <laughs> can we speed this process up? Well, as it turns out, no. Damage will be done if we try to do that. It is a myth that we can accelerate a child's developmental milestones. Children are kind of pre-programmed to reach those points. And I think that is just pretty interesting that here's a secular scientist saying children are pre-programmed to reach those points. Well, who pre-programmed them? <laughs> this, in other words, they were created to develop that way. Okay, so to understand this a little more, let's understand how the brain is extremely plastic, during, especially during childhood. We're understanding more from brain science now. The brain remains plastic throughout life, but it is very plastic during childhood. And this allows the brain to shape and to mold and to adapt to its environment. That's a tremendous responsibility and privilege for parents. But it also allows the brain to compensate. This plasticity allows the brain to compensate for a region that may be damaged, or a region that may be undeveloped. But the problem is those replacement regions are not the correct regions, and the brain will forever be making do. So imagine a five-year-old boy in class. He's sitting there with his textbook. Where does this academic thinking need to take place? The logic areas of the brain. But those areas of the brain haven't developed yet, so Given what we know about the plastic compensation abilities of the brain, what is the brain going to do? It's going to say, all right, I need such and such a region for this higher level thinking, but it's not developed yet. So let me look around and find somewhere that already has developed and myelinated. Great, I found that. What are those going to be at this early age? Very basic thinking centers. And it begins to route the thinking through that area. It's making do. But it's using a lower thinking center not the correct higher thinking center that would be ideal for this type of learning. And it begins to form a habit. And so after a few years of early schooling, the brain has formed habits through the wrong thinking center. Later on, when the correct region has developed, it's not gonna switch to those because it's already formed a habit. If a task is asked, the brain, asked of the brain for which the corresponding region is not matured, it will form neural routes through lower, more developed sections, resulting in almost permanent organizational damage. 
Trying to force a child to learn a concept for which they are not ready can actually do damage to the unmyelinated brain. This is an actual physiological occurrence in the brain. Uh, let me read you from Dr. Jane Healy, who is a renowned educational psychologist. Before brain regions are myelinated, they do not operate efficiently. For this reason, trying to force or make, as she says, children master academic skills for which they do not have the required maturity may result in mixed up patterns of learning. If the right or the correct brain system isn't yet available or working smoothly, forcing may create a functional organization in which less adaptive lower systems are trained to do the work. Or put more simply, trying to drill higher level learning into immature brains may force them to perform with lower level systems and thus impair the skill in question. And what we begin to create is something called learned helplessness, which <laughs> is always a struggle when I'm speaking with a translator, the learned helplessness. And they, they're like, what's that supposed to mean? It, it must be a learning disability where you're not able to learn. No, 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 no. You've learned that you're not able to learn. And there's a difference there. We've actually begun to form a habit in the brain that I'm not able to do this. It's too hard for me. And so they learn that they are helpless at learning a particular thing. Later on, they may be perfectly capable, but they forever believe I'm bad at math or I'm bad at reading or I'm bad at you know, whatever they've been struggling with. A child who is required to learn things before he is ready may quickly tire of them, or he may become anxiety-ridden and so frustrated that he will not try at all. <clears throat> Any learning that has to be pushed into a child may end up doing more harm than good. Plunged daily into the fire of inappropriate expectation, children's early promise shrivels and non-learning becomes a habit. They may be labeled, treated, exhorted, and eventually tutored, but the basic issue remains unchanged. The school and the child are on different schedules. Now, I want to be clear here that, you know, a lot of the way school works has been catered to function with these lower thinking centers of the brain. It's about filling in the check boxes and doing the exercises, and you don't really need the higher thinking levels of the brain. But how many maybe could relate to this example if I give you, or a young person, you give them a math problem, here's this, here's your formula, calculate it. No problem, yeah, no, 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 I can do that calculation. Now, let me give you a word problem. Oh, I don't like word problems, I don't know how to do those, right? <laughs> What's the difference? It's the same thing, you need the same formula, same calculation, why is the word problem so much harder than me giving you the, the, the calculation to do? It's because you don't understand the concept. And so that's a real big difference here. When you're routing the thinking through these basic thinking centers by starting early, you can learn to do the examples on paper, but you're never really going to understand it deeply and understand the concept of it. To take that example of math, if you learn the concepts of addition, for example, by just working in the kitchen, you don't need to do all the exercises, right? You're going to understand how it works. And you can jump right to, and I've seen this in many, many cases, you can take a child who has been learning practical math in everyday life and just put them immediately in sixth grade math, having never opened a textbook. Because they understand what it means. You, you can just skip that whole time of, of drill and exercise. So parents, make this practical. Be patient. Don't get in a hurry. Don't succumb to the societal pressure. And to be clear, it's not that we're preventing the child from learning, teaching themselves how to read or something like that. It's just, it's not our focus now. Learn in practical, hands-on ways rather than with books and focus on character. We'll talk a little more about that later, but let's move some, through some other points here. Let's talk about the development of the eye. I mentioned eye teaming earlier. That's the ability to use both eyes to focus on the subject. Very important for reading skills. You also have foveal focus, which is two-dimensional focus. Again, important for reading. When you're looking at text on a page, this is not three-dimensional eye use. So this is two-dimensional. Now, these abilities in the eye do not fully develop until around the age of seven to nine. <clears throat> and yes, okay, here we go. The eyeball is not completely shaped with collagen fibers until approximately age nine. Long periods of reading without relaxing focus into the distance could possibly, and uh, Dr. Hannaford said possibly, we now understand it, it absolutely does, cause inflammation and a, the elongation, elongation of the eyeball leading to myopia. Interesting. Myopia is the most common eye problem in the world today. 
which is nearsightedness, we often call it in the US here. Rates of myopia, difficulty seeing distant objects, are soaring. The trend is matched in many other countries, causing eye doctors to wonder what could be causing the decline in human vision. Okay, let's understand myopia a little bit. The normal eye is round in shape with the focal point right at the back of the eyeball. But the myopic eye becomes elongated and it changes the focal point into the eyeball and that makes it so when you look into the, at um, something in the distance, it becomes blurry and you have to bring it closer to be able to see it. Now, when we look into the distance, our eye is at rest. But when we begin to take something from the distance and we bring it close in front of our eyes, the muscles, the ciliary bodies around the lens, this, no, the pointer doesn't work on the screen. The, the ciliary bodies around the lens that control the shape of the lens, they have to contract to bring the vision into focus up close. Looking in the distance, they're relaxed. Come up close, they have to contract to be able to bring the, the vision into focus. Over time, if you're doing that, uh, when the eyeball is soft and supple during childhood, these ciliary bodies are pulling on their attachment points and the outer layers of the eyeball, and it begins to actually stretch the eyeball. And it literally causes myopia simply by reading for long periods of time during childhood. And it's interesting, and there are many other factors involved with this, it's interesting though to compare different areas of the world and the rates of myopia. Scientists have long said, well, I should say eye doctors <laughs> have long said that myopia is genetic. You go to your eye doctor, hey, why do I have, you know, why do I have to wear glasses? Why do I have myopia? It's, you know, it's genetic. There's nothing really you can do about it. But science has shown that genetics is really only a very small factor it's much more related to lifestyle. So the US is about 50% myopic, whereas East Asia, 90% myopic. Seoul, Korea, 96% myopia. And again, they used to always say, well, it's just genetic, but is there maybe a difference in the lifestyle? <laughs> which country as a whole, I'm generalizing greatly here, but which one spends more time in academic study, indoors, reading, East Asia, definitely. They did a study in Alaska. Alaska became a state in, what was it, 59? I don't remember. So it was something like that, it was later. And they had an interesting situation with the Inuit population, the indigenous Inuit peoples, because these peoples had not gone to school, um, at least not very much or not very early. But now Alaska became a state and they were requiring that all the children go to school starting at age six or whatever it was. And so kind of an interesting situation there. So they compared the rate of myopia after a few years, compared the rate of myopia in the parents and grandparents with the children and young people. Here's what they found. The children and young people exhibited 60% myopia. 60% of the children and young people were myopic. Now, if myopia is genetic, what percentage would you expect to find in the parents and grandparents? At least 60, right? Because age should bring this on also. Here's what they found. Can you see it? <laughs> Less than 1%. And they said, oh, so um, maybe it's not all genetic. Again, looking around the world, US, 50% myopic. East Asia, 90%. Africa, a continent still predominantly indigenous or at least spending a lot more time outdoors, even if they are going to school at an early age, 15 to 20% myopic. And as they continued to do these studies, they found very clear correlations, even among similar um, genetic, genetically similar populations. For example, in the city of Natal, Brazil, they found 13.3% myopia. Pretty low, yes, but if they looked at the indigenous tribes around the city, 2.7% myopia. It was directly correlated to how much time they were spending indoors and studying. They did another study in Brazil, or actually it may have been part of the same study. Indigenous people of the upper Rio Negro region of the Amazon rainforest in northwestern Brazil. They found that myopia was rare among the indigenous population, and that, interestingly, age was not associated with the refractive errors of the indigenous people. But what do you always hear? You know, it just develops with age, right? Age was not a factor. Brazilians from the small city in which the study was performed had higher rates of myopia, there's a reason for country living. Older pre-education adults also had a very low prevalence of myopia, whereas the younger, slightly educated Brazilians had a higher prevalence of myopia, very linked to lifestyle. 
And they concluded the low prevalence of myopia in the illiterate indigenous people is consistent with other studies and suggests that myopia is related to literacy. <laughs> Fascinating, which is really interesting to me. Let's think about God's original ideal. You know, when they study the brain, um, there is no one part of the brain that is responsible for reading. Reading is a function of the brain that involves many areas that the brain has adapted to, science has concluded. We were not designed to even read. And you're like, what in the world? No, think about what was God's original plan? Face to face, oral communication. God directly spoke to his people. It was passed on generation to generation. They had incredible minds that would retain this information. Now, am I saying we need to get rid of books? <laughs> no, don't take me that far. But, I mean, books are wonderful. But, you know, we're dealing with a plan B in this situation here. But I just find it interesting that we see a, a result of this less than ideal situation that we're living in now in, in the course of of human history. But how can we avoid this problem developing is by starting the reading later where it will not stress the eyes, right? So if we wait until around age nine when the eyes are more firmed up with those collagen fibers, uh, they find far lower rates of myopia. Yes? Wow. Strange when they start school. Uh, can we connect the dots here, right? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Um, and again, don't, you know, I just want to be clear as I shared the thing about reading. I'm not saying we're going to dispense with reading. I hope nobody took that. I'm just, you know, pointing that out because it's interesting, and we can help avoid that by starting the reading at a later age. So close-up work is one of the major factors in the development of myopia. Uh, but another major factor is a lack of time outdoors. God created us to spend time outside, and children especially need that. They found children who spend less time outside were at a greater risk of developing myopia. Okay, again, back to this diagram we saw. Remember, the myopic eye is elongated. Tuck that term in your mind. They found light stimulates the release of dopamine in the retina, and this neurotransmitter, in turn, blocks the elongation of the eye during development. Wait a second. <laughs> Light was causing the release of a chemical in the eyeball that was preventing it from developing myopia. Light was preventing myopia. Okay, what kind of light do we need? You know, do our children need some kind of, you know, light therapy? Were they looking into a flashlight for a few hours a day or something? You know, <laughs> no. Going outside. Going outside. Children need to spend around three hours per day under light levels of at least 10,000 lux to be protected against myopia. How much is 10,000 lux? Full daylight is 10,000 lux. Sunlight, full sunlight is more than 10,000. Heavily clouded day would be a bit under 10,000, but it's full daylight. Now, lux is a measurement of the volume of light, so you may go outside this window and be getting 10,000 lux, but as you come into this room, the volume of light coming through the window is dissipated into the room, and so the lux measurement drastically drops. And so it's not the intensity of a single light source, it's the total volume of light. So again, 10,000 lux out of doors. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what a well-lit classroom or office is in a lux measurement? 12, ooh, somebody's listened to the presentation before. <laughs> 500, far below. I was doing a seminar in New Zealand and somebody raised their hand. No, actually here in New Zealand we require at least 700 lux. Great, but <laughs> that's not 10,000, right? Uh, the only way you're going to get that is going out of doors. I uh, was in uh, Europe doing a seminar also, and there was a, a television studio there who was recording, and uh, he had a Lux meter, the director of the recording. And uh, so he said, hey, I'm going to see if you're right. And so he went outside, opened the meter, 12,000. He came inside to the church, opened it up. It was 400 and something. So far below what's necessary for the development of the eye. 
Uh, quick story real quick. I have a friend who had severe myopia as a young as a child and young person, and uh, she was about 12 when she went for her yearly checkup to the eye doctor, and the doctor said, well, you know, unfortunately at the rate your myopia is progressing, you'll probably be legally blind within about a year. Imagine hearing that as a 12-year-old. So the mother asked the eye doctor, well, why? What's causing this? Uh, what do you think the answer was? It's genetic. Nothing you really can do about it. You and your husband both have bad eyes, so your daughter does too. She was driving home thinking about it. Said, Wait a second. First of all, the Bible says the curse causeless shall not come. And second of all, she says, my son has nearly perfect vision and my daughter's about to go legally blind. If this is purely a genetic factor, then why the, why the difference there? So she did some research. She found this study. She said, oh, that's really interesting because my son, <laughs> I can't get him indoors. He almost lives outside. Whereas my daughter hates going outside. I wonder if there's a connection. So she talked to her daughter and said, hey, we're going to do a little experiment here. You're going to start going outside for a minimum of two hours every day. Oh, that was a battle. <laughs> She took her violin outside in practice. She'd do her schoolwork outside. And didn't really get the idea of, you know, like physical activity and those sorts of things. But hey, she was outdoors. She was getting that light. Six months later, back to the eye doctor. He said to come back in six months because it was progressing so rapidly. And he said, I don't quite understand this. Your eyes are the same as they were six months ago. Okay, thank you very much. They went home, didn't tell the doctor what they were up to. Came back after a year, back to the eye doctor. He said, I really don't understand this. Your eyes, uh, your myopia has not progressed at all. He said, I've never seen anything like this. It's supposed to progress. I mean, that's just what it was going to do. So they told the doctor, well, here's what we've been doing. We found this research, you know, spending the time outdoors. Do you think maybe there's a connection? The uh, eye doctor's like, no, it's just coincidence. I don't think there's really any connection. <laughs> <laughs> they were following God's methods, right? And God's methods work. So, again, to make it practical, spend several hours outside every day, limit the close-up work and reading. Again, even if a child, maybe at a younger age, teaches himself how to read, it's good to limit those reading periods to 15 or 20 minutes, just a couple, three, four times a day at the most, um, to avoid the stress on the eyes. Limit and eliminate screen time also. That's a big damage to the eyes and a cause of myopia. You know, when, when you're on the, on the device, uh, do you see people holding it out here? No, that's not right. People a lot of times rest their elbows and, and it's very close to the eyes and that's damaging to the eyes. Okay, quickly through some other points on this topic. Physical development. Now, what are the two most common commands given to children in the classroom? Sit still and don't talk. Be quiet. Is there a problem with that? Well, we know from brain science, as I talked about this morning, that physical activity is essential for proper brain development. So as we tell a child to sit still for hours a day, we're actually preventing their brain from developing. Yes, it's important that children learn how to do that, but when we're talking in extended periods of time throughout the day, it is hindering their brain from developing properly. Um, <clears throat> There's something known as the brain-derived neurotropic factor, a fascinating chemical that's been dubbed miracle growth for the brain. It is a powerful chemical that helps support the neurons of the brain and even encourages new neurons to grow and protects from stress and cell death. And it is released by our working muscle, well, through a chain of, of proteins that is then released into the brain every time we move our muscles. But what's fascinating is they found that BDNF is required for myelination to proceed. Are we catching this? It's released by movement and it is required for myelination to proceed. So literally children have to move for their brains to develop. They will not develop properly unless you are getting physical activity. <laughs> Professor at Georgia Regents University, I think that parents need to go to educators and say, why is my child sitting down for six hours a day when he's a seven-year-old boy and he needs to move? That'd be a good question to ask, wouldn't it? <laughs> but what were we told in the spirit of prophecy? Small children should be left as free as lambs to run out of doors, to be free and happy, and should be allowed the most favorable opportunities to lay the foundation for sound constitutions. Now we've read this, and unfortunately, it has been misinterpreted at times. 
to mean no structure, no guidance. We just open the door in the morning. We boot the kids out and say, come back at supper time. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Have you ever seen a flock of sheep? Have you ever seen some little lambs playing together? Who's nearby? Mom. Mom sheep. The shepherd too. <laughs> we know the representation of the shepherd, right? But mom is nearby. So this isn't saying the absence of the parents. This is talking about the environment and the activity that they're supposed to be in. As much of the day as possible should be active, play together. And speaking of play, I put this up just for humor's sake. Uh, children should learn mainly through play until the age of eight, says Lego. <laughs> well, I guess they probably would, right? <laughs> but interestingly, as I read through the study, they're absolutely right. The children should be learning from play. But we do want to balance that with the counsel and the spirit of prophecy that children need to learn how to work also. And work can actually um, accomplish many of the benefits that play accomplishes in the science and um, all the, the evidence we find for that. Okay, but we talked about, you know, we don't want to make them sit still all the time. What about telling them to be quiet all the time? Have you ever watched a group of children playing? Are they perfectly quiet? <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> What about a little child by himself? Is he perfectly quiet? No. In fact, if it's perfectly quiet, usually like, oh, something's going on, right? <laughs> Why? Who's he talking to? He's just talking to himself, right? And that's because children don't have something known as inner speech. Inner speech is the ability to internalize our thoughts and to think without having to say it out loud. But children don't have that developed until around age eight, more or less. So children literally think out loud. And when we make them be quiet for hours on end, we prevent them from thinking. And they will not develop the ability to think well. They also will not develop good reading abilities because that is essential for reading. Good language like the synapses that make it possible is gained only from interactive engagement. Children need to talk as well as to hear, but the problem is children are always talked to and not with. <clears throat> and this is also an interesting point that so insistent is the need for outer speech, saying it out loud, to hear one's own voice and thoughts, that silent reading is ineffective before the age of seven. How many times, you know, just, you know, why don't you sit there and read to yourself a little bit and but it's not the age for it. It's ineffective. They're not going to be getting much from what they're trying to read. <clears throat> so uh, quiet and simple lifestyle, very important for developing language abilities. Individual time with adults is important. They should be allowed to talk to themselves, and certainly talking together is great also. Parents should have uh, that time of conversation with even their little ones. <clears throat> What about emotional development? This is a really significant issue, actually, and the most significant damage, of course, occurs when we send a child off to school. But damage can also occur, even in the home, when we're asking a child to perform age-inappropriate tasks, developmentally inappropriate tasks um, that they're not ready for. Ignotion, emotion and cognition are not two separate areas of the brain. They are, in fact, very interconnected. In fact, emotion and emotional development lays the foundation for cognitive development. Did we catch that? Emotional development lays a foundation for cognitive development. This is why when we have a child who may be exhibiting a learning disability, a good assessor <coughs> will look into the home environment also. And more often than not, they find some kind of emotional disturbance, neglect, abuse, uh, divorce, something like that. And that is often very linked to learning disabilities. Emotional security is seen by the developing brain as a fundamental need of survival. So how do we develop emotional security? Very simple, relationship. Quality relationship develops emotional security. And that quality relationship with the parent is the best way to provide that emotional security. That relationship with the parent is the most important relationship from an emotional development standpoint. There's just no way around that. And, uh, you know, we, we ask ourselves about socialization and things like that, but it may be a good question, but the, the single most important socialization and development uh, from an emotional standpoint that a child can get 
is going to be in the home with the parent. Emotional well-being and social competence provide a strong foundation for emerging cognitive abilities. And together they are the bricks and mortar that comprise the foundation of human, in de uh, human development. Furthermore, when children have educational experiences that are not geared to their developmental level or in tune with their learning needs and cultures, it can cause them great harm, including feelings of inadequacy, anxiety, and confusion. Notice what's going on here. As we're asking a child to do something they're not ready for, we're actually causing them to feel inadequate, causing anxiety, ca causing confusion. Why? Because they trust the adult, and this adult is asking them to do something that even subconsciously, they, they can't figure out, you know, it's a struggle for them, or maybe even consciously they struggle with it. And so subconsciously, they begin to blame themselves. Like, well, this person I trust is asking me to do something, but I'm not able to do it, so something must be wrong with me. And they begin to feel, actually, that they have some kind of problem. So uh, socialize primarily in the home in the first few years. Develop a solid relationship with your children. Spend a lot of time together. Time spent cuddling, gazing, and playing establishes a bond of security, trust, and respect on which the entire child development period pyramid is based. Now let's talk a little about socialization. Socialization is important. We talked this morning, though, about how, where, what environment do we find the best socialization? Age segregation or age integration? Integration. We actually have better socialization. I remember a, a friend of mine, I was asking about socialization. He's homeschooling his children, and he said, yeah, you know, one time I was driving by a public school, and I looked into the playground, and there was a boy smashing the head of another boy into the ground, and he said, if that's the socialization my kids are going to get in school, then I don't want them socialized. <laughs> and he had a pretty good point, right? There's different types of socialization. We have good socialization, and we have negative socialization, so we need to um, make sure we're defining the type of socialization that we're looking to get. Children in the age mixed environment, though, within the family especially, um, will develop better socialization skills and better abilities to relate to a wide range of ages because they've been brought up in that environment. So certainly children don't need to go to the school environment at an early age to develop good social skills. Memory abilities. Some may think, well, you know, doesn't uh, all that academic work help develop the memory? <laughs> well, let's refer it back to what we talked about this morning. That focus on the memory actually weakens the mind, right? We don't even want to focus necessarily on the memory. But is it good to have good memory skills? Yeah, absolutely. We want good memory skills. So how can we develop good memory skills without focusing on the memory? Let me read you something from actually a former professor of mine, Dr. Cheryl Desjarlais. The North Queensland Aborigines, for example, recite a song by memory that takes five nights to complete. I, I can't even remember all the words to a hymn out of a hymnal, all the verses out of a hymnal, right? Primitive peoples can observe a herd of several hundred animals and detect the absence of a single animal and know which one it is without counting. Many of their vocabularies are full of names for very detailed aspects of the world around them. I was in uh, Tanzania and was doing a seminar at a school, uh, which was part of a larger mission. And I shared about this, and um, the livestock director, they, they have as part of the mission, they have a livestock program and the, some cattle and things. And the director of the livestock program came and talked to me afterward. And she said, hey, you know what you talked about there, about them recognizing and recognizing if, a, if an animal is missing? She said, that's absolutely correct. I said, really? Tell me about this. She said, yeah. And she's from the U.S. She's a volunteer. And uh, she said, we have native Maasai. Anyone heard of the Maasai tribe? Yeah. These men, that we hire them to take care of our herd of cattle. And she said, we can come in the evening and bring our herd of 70-some cows to get water in the evening. And these men will just take a glance over the herd and say, oh, we're missing such and such a cow. And they just name the cow they're missing. Like it's just fact, obvious, everyday life. And she said, one day... <laughs> I went to talk to them and I said, hey, you know, I'm the livestock director here. Can you please teach me how to know when we're missing a cow? They looked at her with shock. They're like, well, how do you not know when you're missing a cow? <laughs> Isn't that obvious information? And it, it was to them, but not to her. But why? Continuing, while the schooled person depends heavily on external signs, such as the written word or Google, 
to, <laughs> to hold knowledge for him. The primitive native depends on memory. Every detail of a landscape is remembered with what seems to be a photographic memory, even the first time passing through. Though most children have an eidectic memory, it is rare among schooled adults, but not among primitive non-schooled adults. And what the research is actually showing is that we are born with incredible memories, but we actually school it out of ourselves <laughs> by always having this written material all the time that we have to refer to constantly. Yes? That would be interesting. I've not seen any. There very well could be. Uh, I think you know what I, mean? I do. Yeah, that is an interesting. I think it's definitely an anomaly in yeah. human development, but that would be an interesting study. So, if we want to help our children learn to memorize scripture and have a good memory, uh, it seems like the natural lifestyle may be the best, right? All right, what about reading skills? Most parents are worried about this. And, uh, it's good to be concerned that we learn to read well. Um, <laughs> can any parents or teachers relate to that picture? <laughs> well, okay, let's first of all look at how the current system, which starts reading instruction very early, is doing. What kind of results do we see? Terrible, <laughs> Terrible right. 21 to 23% of adults are functioning at the lowest level of literacy. 25, whoops, 25 to 28% are found to be low-level literate. That's nearly 50% of the population. This is current research. Well, the study I found was a 2002 report. They did another one in 2012. They found almost the same results, so it's not improving. 50% of the population is either illiterate or functioning at low levels of literacy. This is the result of the system pushing reading at an early age. Can we do better than this, friends? <laughs> So, how do we develop good reading skills? First of all, it's a myth that you need to start early to learn to read well. In fact, the studies found that late starters generally do better in their reading abilities. <clears throat> in many schools, children are identified as behind with reading before they would have even started school in many other countries. <laughs> What's the standard here as the correct age to start reading? In one country, they're like, Oh, it's normal childhood. They haven't learned to read yet. In another country, they're like, whoa, they're behind. We better do special instruction. Where's the standard as to what the correct age to start is? So to understand this, we need to understand how reading skills are developed. The Early Childhood Research Quarterly, which is a very well-respected journal, found that the foundation of later reading, and in particular reading comprehension, is language. Okay. So to lay a foundation for good reading skills, we need to start with language skills. How do you develop good language skills? We talked about this already. Okay, reading to them, that would be important. But before you even get there, what, talking to them, right? You can just start with everyday conversation. And yeah, reading to them is, is excellent also. So you want to start with just talking together. The next thing you can do is begin to answer those questions. Children like to ask questions, don't they? <laughs> so when they ask that question, hey, uh, what's this letter? Or can you show me how to write my name? Or what's that sign say? Or what's the name of this book? Or what's that, you know, read me the story. And all those things that the children like to ask. Just take that minute, just a minute here and there, and you teach a little bit. And you think, well, I'm not really teaching them how to read. Once, sometime, you know, they'll be old enough and I'll start teaching them how to read. No, you are teaching them how to read. Little bit by little bit. And they're building the blocks in their brain. And more often than not, they will take those blocks and teach themselves how to read. And I'm saying literally more often than not. In the great majority of cases, without pressure, but with intentionality on the part of the parent to teach through the little occurrences of everyday life, a child will teach themselves how to read. Some people take that and they're like, well, I'm just, you know, locking up all the books, no reading, can't expose them to letters or anything like that, and they're, they're going to teach themselves how to read once they reach age 10. No, you're exposing to them, exposing them to it throughout everyday life. You're not making it a point to sit them down and teach them how to read, but they're exposed to it. And more often than not, a motivated child will just teach themselves how to read. I <laughs> I remember a mom who was telling me, and I've heard the story so many times, but this one was particularly funny. She said one day her, um, I don't remember, six or seven-year-old boy came, I think he was about seven, he came up to her and uh, had a book in his hands. Mom, I want to read you a story. 
okay, go ahead and read me the story. And she's expecting, you know, book upside down, and it's a made-up story. So he opened the book, and it was correct, and he actually read her the story on the page there. And she's like, he doesn't know how to read. How's he doing this? <laughs> he never read yet. And she said, you know, he's probably memorized that story. It's one we read a lot. So she said, I'll do a little test here. She turned to another story that he wasn't very familiar with. Read me that story. And he read it. And she's like, in her words, she goes, I was a little bit mad because I'm like, it was my job to teach him how to read and he beat me to it. <laughs> but, and she's like, how did he figure this out? And she realized yeah, it was just part of everyday life and he just was piecing it together because children are born loving to learn. But when we sit them in the classroom, we make it this drudgery that they hate going through, pretty soon they're gonna hate learning. But if we keep them in that natural environment and they're gonna be self-motivated, they're gonna want to learn. And then, of course, use books and reading as a source of gaining needed information about something. Whoever invented the Dick and Jane reading series, I think, was trying to make children bored, all right? Who really cares about Dick and Jane? Let's read something interesting, okay? <laughs> let's have real stories, interesting things. When they have a question, okay, let's go to the book, the encyclopedia, and figure it out. Things like that. You're teaching them the value and an enjoyment of books. Literally, learning to read is quite easy. Uh, research shows that it takes less than 30 hours of contact instruction with reading to reach a college proficient level of reading. And uh, really what I've seen, it's, it's even less than that. Um, although, you know, how are you going to add that all up when it's just a minute here and there throughout the years? Uh, but nonetheless, it doesn't need to be the struggle that it's often made to be with endless flashcards and drills and word lists and all this sort of thing. Um, and it may come at eight, it may come at, uh, some children are super ambitious and they're very young when they teach themselves how to read. That's okay, as long as, again, remember the development of the eye, don't allow it for long periods of time, educate them about the reason why you don't wanna do it for long, and then replace it with getting outside and things that are healthy. Um, it may come later too, though, and sometimes they may need a little bit of encouragement. I remember the story of a I think he was 12 and he, still not reading, and his parents were getting a little bit concerned, but they thought he probably had figured it out by now. They'd given him some specific instruction about it. it, just, he wasn't really reading. And every day for family worship, they go around the circle and skip him as they're reading. And one day, Dad said, no, you're gonna read today. I don't know how to read, Dad. Yeah, give it a try. And he read perfectly well. <laughs> And I mean, it, it took a little bit of encouragement over a week or so, and he was completely fluent in reading. So sometimes, yes, there needs to be a little motivation. I have another friend who uh, was kind of concerned. Her, her, I think, teenage son was really not reading very well. And um, she was at a loss to come up with any method to try to uh, help him and encourage him into reading. Even though she had instructed him, instructed him in it, he just wasn't very efficient and not a very good reader and, and was just really struggling with it. Well, then he got some animals as part of the farm because he just loved farming. And so he got some animals and he started needing to do some research uh, for some various things that were involved with these animals. And I think at first he took the books to his mom. Can you, can you read these to me? She's like, no, you can read them for yourself. And in a pretty short time, he was a pretty proficient reader. Why? Because it was something he had to do, not because mom was forcing him to, but because his circumstances and his interest was motivating him into it. So again, I'm sharing all these different illustrations and stories to, um, to help us see it's not the complicated process that we usually make it out to be, and it also can take many different forms and come in different methods. Um, <clears throat> let me share just a little bit of science with you. They did a study comparing, and this is measuring the average decoding and reading fluency of two groups of children. The blue represents a group that started reading instruction, that's RIA, reading instruction age, at age five, and then the orange represents a group that started at age seven. Notice at age five, okay, we have that first group starting. Age six, there's a few who are developing a few reading abilities on their own, and then at age seven, we have that second group beginning to be instructed how to read. Now, go to age eight. If we did a comparison at age eight, what would we conclude? Start early. Start early, definitely. Look how much farther advanced those ones who started early are. 
And think about age eight. Think about the comparisons we're doing at age eight. You know, that, that's a common age that we're doing a lot of, well, are, are they reading it? Are they doing it? You know, what about if we just waited a year? Look at age nine. Look what happened. They caught up. Not only that, but those who started earlier, how much did they advance? Pretty much stayed the same, right? Because it was routed through the wrong area of the brain. And then at age 11, look what happened. They passed, the later ones passed up the early ones in their reading abilities. The children who developed, who started at five, developed less positive attitudes towards reading and showed poorer text comprehension than those children who had started later. And uh, they've also looked at Montessori children who are well known for you know, teaching this very early and they found, again, no advantage. The later ones uh, were superior in their abilities. Our findings suggest that success at reading is not assured by an earlier beginning. One other story here before we go on to our last couple of points. This was a, a somewhat informal research project that they did in a kindergarten classroom. It is true that some children can learn to read remarkably early, but the fact that they can does not necessarily mean that they should. Should is another question. One school district set up an experiment to help decide this question. Some kindergartners in the district received extensive instruction in reading. Others spent the same amount of time learning science. They melted ice, they observed thermometers in hot and cold places, they played with magnets, grew plants, learned about animal life, and so on. Books and pictures were available to these children if they wanted them, but no formal instruct lessons in reading were held. What was the result? By third grade, the science children were far ahead of the reading children in their science scores, in their reading scores. The reason? Their vocabularies and thinking skills were more advanced. They could read on more topics and understand higher level materials. The reading children, by starting earlier, used up a lot of learning time on the skills of reading, while the science children spent the time learning real stuff. And when they did begin reading, they were older and knew more and learned in a fraction of the time that others took. Pretty interesting, right? Real life. So talk together, read to the child, allow plenty of time for movement and activity, utilize the questions and the incidental learning. All right, let's cover a couple of other points before we finish the effect on boys. Have we seen in society Satan's attack on boys and men? I, I think that is pretty obvious, isn't it? And there are many methods that he is taking to do this, but remember I talked about the two-year difference in brain development between boys compared to girls. Because of that approximately two-year lag in brain development, all the effects we've just discussed will be intensified in the boys. So the problems that we've discussed, they actually be worse in the boys than in the girls. What are the results? Boys today are not learning as well as girls. Boys receive 70% of the Ds and Fs given all students. Boys cause 90% of classroom discipline problems. 80% of all high school dropouts are boys. Millions of boys are on Ritalin and other mind-bending control drugs. Three out of four students labeled learning disabled are boys. So did God just create boys to be a problem? <laughs> I asked that question a while ago and there was a brother and sister in the front row and the sister quickly assured me that yes, <laughs> they were created to be a problem. No, of course not, right? <laughs> but let's think about what is God's purpose for the boys? What's God's purpose? What was that? Leaders. What kind of leaders? spiritual leaders in their homes and in their churches. Satan doesn't want that, does he? And what's interesting is that during this two-year difference in brain development, the areas of the brain that take longer to develop in the boys are the ones that are particularly influential in spiritual strength. Satan knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Doesn't want that to develop. Let's put him in school early. And so we're actually creating a lot of the problems we see in boys today. And um, as a friend of mine said, we're, or I've heard it said, I don't remember who said it, but uh, we're, treating, we're treating boys like defective girls. Treating boys like defective girls. You know, we're like, well, they're not learning right, but the girls are doing fine, so something must be wrong with the boys. No, they just develop differently. Boys can do great on academic skills, don't get me wrong, but they just need some extra time, and there's nothing wrong with that. The early curriculum is more accelerated than ever before. Boys are expected to do too much too soon. Their brains aren't ready for it. They begin their school careers in the dumb group. They're frustrated with their lack of ability. They start disliking school and they begin to avoid it. We're seeing that more than ever now. 
ADHD and other attention problems, I'm not going to go into that right now, but um, the research is very clear that between media and early schooling, we pretty much have created ADHD. And if we were to get rid of the media, especially in childhood and the early schooling, we would almost see ADHD disappear. We found that delaying kindergarten for one year, notice the difference here with just one year, reduced inattention and hyperactivity by 73%. That is a major improvement for an average child at age 11. And it virtually eliminated the probability that an average child at that age would have an abnormal or higher than normal rating for the inattentive hyperactive behavioral measure. And that's just really schooling. Get rid of media also, and we almost wouldn't even have the problem. But now, won't children be left behind? Good question. You know, if we wait till age eight or 10, how are they going to catch up? Thankfully, we don't need to worry about that because children who start, after ac start academics after age eight usually end up far ahead of the early starters. When they're given time for their minds to develop, they'll experience a lot less frustration when the academics do begin and will learn much faster because they're ready to learn it. In a study of 300 individuals who started school at about age eight or later, all quickly caught up with their classes and in most cases performed well above the class average. There's a lot of research on this. And uh, most late starts, usually without formal training before their first school enrollment, quickly catch up academically and often pass their more school experienced peers. And the late starters generally excel in behavior, sociality, and leadership. Okay, but how do we do this? What does it look like practically? As I mentioned earlier, if you're learning from practical everyday life, you can jump a lot of those earlier grades, just start a later grade. And we don't even need to be doing the grades in the curriculum to begin with. Uh, <laughs> um, but in terms of like, okay, what, you know, do I have to try to catch them up on these things that they maybe would have learned earlier in, in the academic? No, not at all. Uh, if they're learning from everyday life, there'd be very little catch up to have to be done. Let me give an illustration. Uh, actually, before I get to that, learning specialist says all of the learning necessary for success in high school can be accomplished in only two or three years of formal skill study. Like, how is that even possible? Let me give an illustration. Okay, first grade, <clears throat> let's say we start learning things like the addition of ones. The brain's not quite ready for it, so what are you going to have to do? Lots of exercises, right? Drill them, drill them, drill them over and over and over and over and over. You're putting it through the wrong thinking centers of the brain, but you're drilling it into the mind, and by the end of first grade, okay, they know how to do this. This is just hypothetical. I'm not saying this is the actual what they do in each grade. I'm just giving the illustration of how curriculum works. Anyone have the answer to this problem? Okay, thank you. Just making sure we're paying attention. Right, second grade comes along. What are we going to do? Review the last year, exactly. <laughs> and now we're going to make it a little bit harder. Same subject, but we're going to make it a little bit harder. This is called the spiral approach to curriculum. Uh, again, maybe it's not exactly these things in each grade, but this is how curriculum works. So second grade comes along, review the previous year because they've forgotten everything over the summer, and now you have to drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it. The brain's not ready for it. Lots more exercises. Anyone figured this one out? All right. Now, third grade, what are, what are we going to do? Review the previous two years, and now we're going to make it more difficult. And still, review, 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 and drill, and drill, and drill, and exercise, and exercise, and exercise. They don't really understand the concept, but they can do it on paper, and they're getting pretty good grades. Anyone have the answer? All right. Fourth grade rolls around. What are we going to do? Review the previous three years and make it a little bit harder, and so we have to do more exercises and more drills. I'll let your wheels turn on this one for a moment. Anyone have it? 2592, very good. All right. Now, the point here was not necessarily to solve these math problems, but <laughs> this is how curriculum works, right? We study the same subjects or the same six, eight, six subjects, eight subjects, whatever, year after year after year, and we just make them a little more difficult each year. That's called the spiral approach. What about if we took a different approach? What about if first grade, second grade, and third grade, we didn't actually crack open the textbook, but we learned from everyday life? Can you learn these things in everyday life? Easy. Go to the workshop, go to the kitchen, whatever it is, you can learn the, these concepts of addition and a lot more than just this. You can learn multiplication and fractions and, and all kinds of advanced uh, subjects. Uh, personally, I knew the Pythagorean theorem before I ever studied algebra. 
because we needed it in everyday life when we were working on building a house. So you can learn these things in everyday life, but then you reach fourth grade and you're like, okay, you know, let's take what you already know conceptually and let's just put it on paper. Get out a piece of paper. What's three plus five? Oh, that's eight. All right, so here's how you write it. Three plus five line, you write the eight there. All right, so what's 14 plus 16? Oh, that's 30. Okay, here's how you calculate that. And so you explain what they already understand and you just put it on paper. You could take, what, 20 minutes, a half hour, and explain this to a fourth grader if they already understand it conceptually. So you literally just skipped three years of struggle and crying and, and uh, damaging the brain, a, a total waste of time that you could have been spending, and here's the important point, I'm gonna get to this in a moment, you could have been spending it on character development. Because this counsel is not all about what not to do. Sometimes we focus, oh, don't do the reading and don't do that. No, that's not really what it's about. It's actually about what we should be doing and how we need to be focusing on character development. And we, we, it takes so much time to develop character that we don't have time for the academics. God knew that. So he said, focus on character for the first eight or 10 years, then worry about the academics later. And he created the brain around that so that they'll learn the academics just fine later on. And there's so many illustrations of this. Let me just tell a couple of, how's our time? Oh, we're over time. Just give me a couple more minutes here. Um, <laughs> I, I'll refer back to my time in Tanzania also, working with a school there as I shared uh, on this concept. And I finished up and I said, hey, do we have any questions before I finish? The principal of the school raised his hand. He said, well, I don't really have a question. I just thought maybe I'd share my experience. You might find it interesting. He said, I was a herds boy, took care of my father's cows until I was 13 years old. And he said, I finally convinced my father to, go to, that, to let me go to school. And uh, I, so I went to school and I learned to read in two days. I'm like, two days, are you serious? Yeah, he said it was easy. I just had somebody explain to me the difference between a B and a D, and once I got that figured out, then we, <laughs> we had it straight. <laughs> in about a week or two, he had caught up with his class level. And he said, uh, it was a few months later, it was time for the national exams. And um, if I remember right, his teacher was like, yeah, let's not do those. You know, you've only been here for a little bit of time. He's like, school's been easy, let me give it a try. So he took the national exams, scored top of the school. In his class level, not you know, back in kindergarten. <laughs> I was like, wow, this guy's a genius. You know, Thank you for the for that story, that's really interesting. Any other questions? One of the teachers raised his hand. Well, I didn't really have a question, I just thought I'd share my experience also. I was actually a herds boy also, and uh, I was about 12 when I convinced my father to let me go to school, and uh, I learned to read in about a week. Must have not been you know, quite as smart as the other guy, I guess. And, <laughs> and he said, within a, a few weeks, I caught up with my class level, and I took the national exams in a little while, and scored almost the top of my school. It's like, wow, we have two geniuses here. It wasn't quite clicking in my mind yet. And uh, I said, well, thank you. That's, those are really interesting stories. Do we have any other questions? Another teacher raised his hand. Not really a question, but I just thought maybe I'd share my experience. And I, I was a herds boy until <laughs> you know the story. <laughs> and I heard the, quest, the, the, the story again and again. I heard it multiple times there. And I realized th this was normal. It was pretty common, especially for a firstborn, because he'd have to take care of the cows longer until a younger sibling would be old enough to take care of the cows, and he'd go off to school, and they did great. They were unintentionally following God's method of education. Now, am I suggesting that we should do that and you know, not learn any of these practical academic skills at a young age? No, we can learn those things. But without even realizing it, they were following God's method of education, they were strengthening the mind through this environment so that when the time came to apply it to the academics, they did great. Another story, some friends of ours from Brazil, they were living in the US for a while and then um, they were supposed to go back to Brazil. And uh, in the state that they were living in the US, it was completely free for homeschooling and so they just kind of didn't do a lot in terms of the structured academic lifestyle. And so they uh, learned a lot from everyday life and lots of conversation and were, you know, visiting 
events and, and um, doing lots of things together as a family and learning a lot, but not really a lot from the actual book. Well, her son was, uh, her younger son, I think he was 12, if I remember right, and people would say, well, what grade are you in? And he's like, well, the last complete grade I finished was second grade, I think. <laughs> and he was always embarrassed about it, which, by the way, grades are so meaningless. When your children are asked about grade, just use the age. You know, when they're eight, they're in whatever grade is corresponding to that. It's, it's, it's so meaningless. Don't worry about that. But anyway, they felt bad about it. The last full grade he'd completed Oh, sure, he'd done some textbooks here and there and learned lots of stuff, but the last full, complete grade out of a curriculum was grade two, and he's 12. Well, it's time to go back to Brazil. Very restrictive there in terms of what they can and can't do, and they have to have a lot of documentation. So the mom said, well, I'm going to have to test uh, my boys and uh, figure out exactly where we're at in terms of academic progress. So she ordered a test. I forget how many subjects there were on it. Um, and it was for him to be assessed to understand what grade level he was at. It was to be done on the computer, um, and she told him, you know, d do a subject and then take a break, go outside, and uh, then come back and do the next one, and, you know, take your time on it, do, do the best that you can. Well, he was just chomping at the bit, ready to take, he was excited to take the test. So he got up early in the morning and knocked the whole thing out, and it took him quite a while, several hours. And the mom's like, oh, man, we, we are done. Uh, you know, this is not going to be a good result. So waited a while, got the results back, and she's just expecting, you know, failure on many of the subjects. Remember, the last complete grade he did was two. The lowest grade she could find was grade eight. He's 12. <laughs> she's like, something's wrong with this. What do you mean, grade eight? grade 8, grade 8, grade 10, grade 12, grade 12, and then there were a few of the subjects listed PHS. And she's like, okay, those are the ones he failed at. She looks in the, in the legend at the back of the book, post high school. What's that mean, Mom? I guess you're done with school. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Again, they were following God's method, right? And God's method worked. Sure, maybe they could have been more intentional. They, she regretted not being a little more intentional about that, and that's up to the Lord's leading. But, um, and to be clarifying, are we saying that, you know, we're going to see amazing academic results for every child? No, that's not our purpose even. It's just a nice side effect often when we follow God's plan, but it's not even our purpose. Okay, our final point as we finish up, what about spirituality? This really is the most important, right? It, it, nothing really matters unless we're developing good character in our children. Research shows us that the early years of childhood are important for the development of spirituality, cause to affect reasoning, emotion, relationships, behavior management, language, memory, moral understanding, conscience, and character. An important list? Ooh, vital, right? All of these the foundation for them is laid in the first seven years of a child's life. And I just imagine Satan and his counsel designs, how can I get the mastery over these children? And he realizes that in the first seven, eight years of a child's life is when the character is developed. And he says, aha, I have an idea. I'm going to get parents confused. I'm going to condition them through society, through regulations, through government, through curriculum, through all these methods, I'm going to condition them to believe that they must focus on academic training in the early years or their child won't do well academically. Not because that's true, but because it's distracting them from their more important job. Are we catching this? <laughs> distracting them from their more important job. The early years are a critical period for the areas of the brain that lay the foundation for spiritual strength. And we have this beautiful instruction here. Selected messages, uh, 437. Parents, especially mothers, should be the only teachers of such infant minds. Now you say, oh, infancy, right? What's infancy? Yes, till age seven. Til, right, she says till age seven or through age seven, depending exactly, but you know, it's around that age. And just previous to this paragraph, she defines it. They should not educate from books. How much more clear can we get? This is not to be our source of instruction at this age. The children generally will be inquisitive to learn the things of nature. They will ask questions. <laughs> 
Did God know something about the nature of a child? They're asking questions, right? They will ask questions in regard to the things they see and hear, and patients should, uh, parents should improve the opportunity to instruct and patiently answer these little inquiries. Now, what does this tell us about the environment? If they're asking questions about the things they see and hear, is, should the environment be structured in a way so, they're, they're, so that they are asking questions about the things we want to teach them about? We find that. Read, I encourage you, read the chapter in the book Education on the Education of Israel. We find God created an environment designed to provoke questions about what he wanted to teach them, which is so backwards from conventional methods of education, right? We're like, here's what I need to teach. Now, here you need to learn it. God says, no, I want to make them ask a question about what I want them to. Imagine you're a teacher in the classroom. I'm, I've given you something to teach. Teach this subject to your students, but you can only do it if they ask a question about it. What are you going to do? You're going to do everything in your power to create this environment and, and move them in the right direction so that they finally ask that question about what you want to teach them. They can, in this manner, get the advantage of the enemy. Who wants the advantage of the enemy? Mm. And fortify their minds of their children by sowing good seed in their hearts, leaving no room for the bad to take root. The mother's loving instructions at a tender age is what is needed by, the formation, by children in the formation of character. And this is a biblical principle. Just quickly, I mentioned a few things here. Ecclesiastes tells us there's, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Right? There, there's a schedule. God is a God of schedule. True education is not the forcing of instruction on an unready and unreceptive mind. The mental powers must be awakened and the interest aroused. Jesus gave an example in the parable. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. So back to where we started. Parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or ten years of age. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, they should open before them God's great book of nature. And the only schoolroom for children until eight or ten years of age should be in the open air amid the opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery, their most familiar textbook, The Treasures of Nature. Is this just about hard benches and poorly ventilated classrooms? <laughs> There's so much more to it than this, right? And again, it's not so much about what not to do, it's about what to do. Right? That's the, it doesn't say here, don't do this, don't do that. It says, no, parents, teach your children. Bring them into contact with nature. Put them in the open air. Teach them the things of God. Ask the, answer the questions that come up about the things that they see and hear. It's about developing character in the first years of life. And so I want to challenge us. First of all, to apply the things that we've talked about, definitely. But there's another, I think, perhaps even another lesson that we could draw from this. We've tended to look at this and kind of think, well, maybe that's a little old-fashioned, maybe it doesn't apply anymore. But then when we see the research, we're like, whoa, that is way more serious than I thought. How many other things has the Lord given us counsel about that we don't have all the research for yet? The world is slowly catching up. Are we going to wait for the world to prove God right? <laughs> we'll forever be the tale if we do that. The only way we will fulfill the position that God has for us is by reading the counsel and saying, though I don't understand it, though the world has not proven it right yet, though it doesn't make sense to me, though I don't know how to apply it, Lord, help me obey and move forward in faith, trusting that he will take care of the consequences. Amen? Let's do the right job at the right time, right? Not the right job at the wrong time. All right, let's close with a word of prayer and then um, maybe we'll have a quick announcement. Father in heaven, as we've considered this beautiful counsel that you've given to us, we're so grateful. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to apply it. And um, not only that, but as we read your counsel, Lord, that we'll be obedient and trusting that you always are right and we don't need to wait for the world to, to catch up. Help us to obey, Lord. Thank you. Please remain with us and send us your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to have a break. Uh, I don't remember the schedule. What time is our next meeting? At 6, was it? At 6. Okay, so we're going to have a break now for supper, I believe. Is that correct? Was our light supper now or after? Now. now. Okay. Light supper now.
and uh, we'll come back at six o'clock. And if you have any questions, please feel free, jot those down, and I'll take some time at the end for questions. And I've also saved the best presentation for last, so don't skip it. <laughs>